If you were trapped in an isolated cabin and handcuffed to your ex's dead body with a deranged killer trying to hunt you down, what would you do? When an anniversary getaway to the lake house turns into an escape room from hell, this woman has to do whatever it takes to survive. But it won't be long before a phantom from her past shows up at the front door, and this fever dream becomes a living nightmare. We're here to break down the mistakes made, what you should do, and how to beat your dead evil ex in till death. <laughs> This couple hasn't been getting along, but by the end of the night, relationship troubles will be the least of their worries. Late on a stormy night, this woman Emma is having drinks with her friend Tom at his upscale New York City apartment. He's clearly in love with her, but she's planning to cut the relationship off, hitting him with the old, it's not you, it's me excuse. The truth is that she's already married to her overly controlling husband, Mark who works at the same law firm. When she arrives at his office, she finds a case file containing police records from a night several years ago when she was assaulted and stabbed by a criminal named Bobby Ray. It turns out that the man is facing a return to prison after violating his parole, and as a criminal defense attorney, her husband is working to keep him out. Emma, of course, is not a fan, but the money has been good to Mark here and he has no intention of changing his ways. That night while out at dinner, Mark gives her a custom-made steel necklace to commemorate their 11th anniversary together. In a healthy relationship, it would probably make for a thoughtful gift, but Emma here sees it more as a reflection of his controlling nature. And when she quietly refuses to try it on, her husband crosses the table to clasp it around her neck himself. Outside of the restaurant, Mark says that he has one more surprise planned and tells Emma to check her jacket pocket, where she finds a blindfold. Putting it on, she goes along with him as they drive out into the remote countryside, but that was her biggest mistake. The drive goes on for over an hour, and every time that she asks him where they're going, Mark refuses to reveal his secret. Just when she's starting to get worried, she feels the car turn on to a dirt road, and finally takes off the blindfold to see that they've arrived at a lake house where they used to vacation in the happier days of their relationship. Mark claims that he brought them there, hoping to rekindle those old feelings, but what he really has planned is anything but romantic. Inside, Mark sets up the rest of the surprise. After following a trail of candles and rose petals through a room of happy pictures from the start of their relationship, she finds him in the master bedroom, waiting for her with two glasses of champagne. To her surprise, Mark actually apologizes for the difficulty that they've been having lately, and finally acknowledges that he hasn't been the best husband over the years. In the morning, Emma wakes up feeling more hungover than she should and quickly starts to suspect that something is wrong. Looking down at her wrist, she realizes that Mark has cuffed the two of them together, but that was only the first part of his plan. As she begins to panic, Mark turns around and suddenly ends things right in front of her. In the bleak of an eye, Emma finds herself handcuffed to her dead husband and trapped alone in this cabin out in the middle of nowhere but it won't be long before things take an even more horrifying turn. Emma tries to call for help using the house phone, but it's no use because Mark already cut the phone line. Instead, she picks up his revolver and tries to shoot the cuff, only to hit another dead end when she discovers that it isn't loaded. That's when it starts to sink in that he planned all of this out on purpose, and she'll need to get creative if she wants to survive. Struggling against his dead weight, she manages to make it to the walk-in closet where she finds only one article of clothing still hanging inside, her old wedding dress. To her surprise, she discovers a large hidden safe behind it that's securely locked with a numerical passcode and fingerprint scanner. It's strange, but she decides to focus on getting herself free for now, having no idea that what's inside of the safe is going to change everything. Okay, I've heard of dead-end relationships, but this is crazy. To be fair, there's no way that she could have seen that coming, but there is no denying the warning signs were there. I'm sorry to say it, Emma, but it looks like you f***ed up. He might have tricked her with the whole I've changed routine, but toxic people will say anything to get what they want. And from an outsider's perspective, Mark here was a walking red flag. 
First off, he was overly controlling of everything in her life, even down to what she chose to wear. There's a fine line between treating your romantic partner like a person and treating them like an accessory and making her go home to change her outfit before dinner. On the night of their 11th anniversary together, definitely crosses it. Someone who's that upfront and uncompromising about imposing what they want onto their significant other isn't going to stop at just their fashion choices. And it isn't hard to see how this could quickly spiral into a dangerous situation. On the car ride out there, Mark here forcefully made her stay blindfolded, even when it was clear that she was starting to get nervous, and was being extremely cryptic about his intentions the whole time. By dropping this trip on her on such short notice and making her wear a blindfold the entire way, he gave her no opportunities to tell anyone else where she was going, which meant that if she ended up needing help, then she was going to be completely on her own. Plus, she clearly didn't trust him to begin with, and not to mention was having an affair with a guy who works in the same office. With all this in mind, I wouldn't be taking a trip out to a cabin in the woods with this guy anytime soon. From the minute that they got there, Emma should have called an Uber, cab, or close friend to come and pick her up, or texted a friend or family member with intentions to keep in touch throughout the trip and tell them to send help if she suddenly stops responding for too long. That way, she would at least know that backup was coming if anything insane were to go down. When you ignore all of the red flags, only to end up with your toxic ex still torturing you from beyond the grave, Emma, you f***ed up. Now, learning from our mistakes is great and all, but it won't count for anything if she dies out here strapped to this weirdo. She needs to get out of these cuffs and as soon as possible, and there's a few ways to go about it. First, I'd try searching Mark's body in the immediate area for a key. In the extremely likely case that there is no key, there are two other approaches that Emma could take. Either smash her way out or pick the cuffs. Personally, I'd start with the smashing. By using something like the top of that coffee table in the nook or by slamming it in the bedroom door, Emma could find a way to bust Mark's hand up enough that she could slip it out of the cuffs and be home free. Even a broken piece of glass or pottery from the shelves above the bed might work to cut his thumb off if she's really desperate. If she's looking to escape with a little bit more finesse, then she could try picking her way out of the cuffs instead. To do this, she'll first need to determine whether the cuff is single or double locked. By checking the side of the cuff, you should be able to locate a small hole with a recessed pin. And if the pin is in the down position, then you know that the cuff is double locked. Once you've figured this out, now it's time to start picking. For this approach, she'll need to find a thin but sturdy piece of metal. A bobby pin would be perfect, but if she doesn't have one of those, then she may be able to use a keychain ring or find something that works from within a piece of furniture. There are two approaches that she can take. After using the keyhole to make a slight bend in one end of the wire, you need to stick it into the top of the keyhole and then twist towards the center of the cuff and down, manipulating the catch until it releases and sets you free. Alternatively, you can shove the wire in through where the ratchet teeth and the body of the cuff meet, eventually forcing the catch bar down and unlocking the cuff. Besides all of that, there is one more option that Emma here is missing, and that's trying to get into the safe. I won't spoil what happens yet, but let's just say that the code wouldn't have been too hard for her to guess, and what's inside would have really helped her out. If none of these ideas work, then her only option is to continue searching the house for a key or tool to break Mark's hand. She's got a real battle ahead of her, but if she keeps her composure and focuses on one problem at a time, Emma just might make it out of this alive. Moving into the kitchen, Emma empties out her purse in search of her cell phone, only to realize that Mark here dunked it in the vase while she was asleep. She manages to fish it out, and for the moment it seems like it's actually going to work, but the damage is too severe. Sure enough, the phone shorts out, and she spikes it to the floor like Gronk celebrating a touchdown, growing more and more frustrated with each and every setback. Desperate to make any sort of progress, she begins searching through the kitchen drawers for a knife to cut herself free, but there's not a single sharp object anywhere to be found. Just when she's running out of ideas, Emma decides to dump out the garbage bin, and in her first lucky break yet, she finds the creep's car keys buried inside under a pile of rose petals. It's a huge win, but there's no time to celebrate because she won't be going anywhere unless she can make it to the garage. And with all of this dead weight holding her back, that's gonna be easier said than done. 
After wrapping her bare feet up in torn up pieces of her dress, she manages to drag Mark's body through the snow and out to the garage, where she painstakingly loads him into the passenger seat of his SUV. Now it's time for the moment of truth. She takes out the key, places it in the ignition, gives it a turn, and, remarkably, the engine starts. Unfortunately, even this success is short-lived because within seconds, the vehicle sputters and stalls out. It looks like the husband of the year here emptied out the gas tank, and just like that, Emma is back to square one. Suddenly, she jumps with shock when she hears Mark's voice. But this isn't some sort of black magic. Being the maniac that he was, Mark here actually recorded a post-mortem message. On it, he taunts her for thinking that she'd escape so easily and confesses that, although he was planning to end things for himself, he was too vindictive to let her go on living peacefully with her new man. Out of options, she's forced to double back into the house, dragging his corpse along with her. Okay, this girl can't catch a break. There has to be something heavy in the garage that she could use to bust his hand. Even slamming it in the truck door itself over and over again should get it done. Alternatively, a broken piece of glass from the vase or kitchen table could be used to cut his thumb clean off, if that's what it takes. If none of these ideas work out, then she could always use the metal part of a seatbelt to break the cuffs by sticking it in between the double-sided section and using all of her strength to twist it back and forth until the pin breaks. Look, however she does it, getting rid of Mark would make surviving this situation so much simpler. And I wouldn't bother with anything else until one of us was finally out of the cuffs. Even then though, she's still not in great shape. Her best chance to get back to civilization is out of gas, and she has no way to call for help, so she's pretty much stranded here until she can figure something out. Spiking her phone <laughs> might not have been the best idea, since it could have been possible to still use if she'd given it some time to dry out, although it's probably a long shot. Also, the truck may not be going anywhere, but the electronics still work, and many modern vehicles come with built-in roadside assistance. There's a small chance that she could use this to contact emergency responders if Mark here forgot to cancel his subscription before he kicked the bucket, but again, that's probably too good to be true. On the bright side, she does have access to water, which means that she could survive out here for as long as two months without any food as long as she keeps herself hydrated and stays warm. For now, it seems like the heat is still on, but if that eventually goes out, then she'll need to make sure that she doesn't freeze to death. I'd suggest heading to the smallest room on the second floor and cutting out the foam from all of the furniture around the house with a piece of broken glass to use as insulation for the area. If she has access to jumper cables or can rig something up, then she might even be able to use the truck's battery to start a fire and keep herself warm while she waits for any help to eventually arrive. Unfortunately, she just can't hoof it out there due to these harsh weather conditions, and especially not with a dead guy still strapped to her wrist. You know, on the ride out, Emma mentioned that they'd been driving for over an hour to get there, and if their average speed was between 45 and 60 miles per hour, this means that they're probably quite far from any sort of civilization. In general, a person can only survive for a few hours in below freezing conditions before frostbite sets in. And uh, when accounting for her lack of gear and the effects of wind chill, we could be talking about as little as 30 minutes before she ends up looking like Jack at the end of The Shining. Staying put for now is going to be her best bet, but if several days go by and help still isn't coming, then she's going to be forced to make the hike. If she still hasn't gotten rid of Mark at that point, then I'd suggest using something from the house or garage to make a sled to help with dragging him along, and then finding a rock to smash his hand with and dumping him at the first opportunity. She should also layer up with as much clothing sheets and foam as she can find from wherever's available in the house to try and give her the best chance of survival. It's gonna be extremely risky, so I'd only try getting out of there on foot if it was an absolute last resort and head straight to the road hoping that someone would drive by before it was too late. Back inside, Emma is washing off her husband's blood in the mirror when she suddenly realizes that the necklace he gave her won't come off no matter how hard she tries. Frustrated that he's still able to torment her even in death, 
She slides both of them down into the basement, hoping to find anything that she can use to get free. Well, those hopes are immediately dashed when she turns on the lights. Just like upstairs, Mark has already removed every tool from the workbench, which she can tell because there are little traced out drawings on the wall where they should be. It looks like this was a waste of time, and now she has to lug his lifeless body back up two flights of stairs. Things start off smoothly enough until she accidentally misses a step and they both go crashing down to the bottom. Furious, Emma shouts at him for being a hypocrite, knowing good and well that he hadn't been faithful to her during their miserable relationship either. But the rage gives her strength, and this time she's able to make the ascent. When she finally reaches the first floor, she swears to his dead body that she's going to get rid of him, no matter what it takes. In the room across the hall, she sees that it's now full of pictures of her and Tom together, indicating that Mark actually knew all about their secret relationship and had been stalking them for quite some time. This isn't all she sees though. Hanging on the wall is a blown up copy of her attacker's mugshot, and next to it is a tape player that was clearly meant for her to find. Pressing play, Emma realizes that it's actually a recording of her police interview, on which she recounts the story of how she was attacked and stabbed by the man before finally punching out one of his eyes with a car key to get away. For years, she's been trying to put these memories behind her, but the horrifying truth is that it won't be long before she and her attacker are face to face once again. Suddenly, Emma panics when she hears a car pull up outside and someone's heavy footsteps approaching the door. Just as they're about to come inside, she slams the door in their face and fastens the lock, but quickly realizes that it's actually just Tom after all. It turns out that he received messages from Emma's phone the night before, saying that she was in trouble and needed help. Knowing that she didn't send the texts herself, Emma pieces together that it must have been part of Mark's evil plan and opens the door to show Tom his dead body. After processing what he's seeing, Tom reveals that while they were spending the night at the cabin, the DA executed a search warrant on Mark's office and were coming after him with charges of tampering with evidence, which would explain why he chose to do what he did. Although Emma insists that she's completely innocent, Tom here points out that the police are going to have questions for them when they show up and is a little hesitant to call for help until they can both get their stories straight. Emma, on the other hand, argues that there's no time to waste, because with all of Mark's meticulous planning, there's no way that he would have sent Tom those text messages just so that he could come and save her. She thinks that it must be a trap, which finally convinces Tom to call for help. But there's just one problem. He left his phone in the car, and that's when they notice a mysterious pickup truck coming towards them down the driveway. Tom immediately recognizes the truck, having passed it parked on the side of the road about a mile back. Emma here is starting to panic, but Tom points out that whoever it is has no way to know for sure that she's even there. So he says that he'll try to get rid of them, and tells her not to open the door for anyone but him. Okay, Tom here, definitely brave, but he just made a terrible call by going out there to confront this guy on his own. They don't know exactly who is about to get out of that truck, but they're pretty sure that it could be trouble. The whole reason for Emma to be staying inside with the doors locked is because she's afraid that this guy might be there to hurt them. So why would Tom choose to expose himself to the potential danger without a plan to fight back? Instead, I would have quickly locked down the house and chosen to stay hidden for as long as possible. That way, you'll have some time to see who the surprise guest is and to figure out what their intentions might be. Let's say it's the worst case scenario and whoever it is starts trying to break in. While they're busy trying to find a way inside, Emma could find a secure location and try to hide for as long as possible, while Tom here attempts to sneak out through the side door and make it to the phone in his car and call for help. Of course, even if he is able to contact the police, it's going to be a while before they can make it all the way out there, which means that Tom and Emma need to be ready to fight for their lives if they have to. It's a terrifying scenario, but by using whatever advantages that they have, there is a chance that they could turn the tables before the attacker even knows what's happening. The key here would be to stay inside and not give away their position until they absolutely needed to. That way, they'd be able to maintain the element of surprise and use their knowledge of the layout of the house to get a jump on this creep first. 
Using whatever weapons they could find, they could ambush their attacker at just the right moment, immobilize, or straight up kill them in self-defense and then take their truck or Tom's car out to safety, where they could get help from emergency services. Unfortunately, Tom here thinks that he can just scare whoever it is off, but he's about to find out the hard way that they have other plans in mind. When the truck finally comes to a stop, a man steps out and approaches the porch carrying a large bag full of tools. He introduces himself as a plumber and says that the homeowner called to fix a burst pipe. But Tom here isn't buying it. Instead, he offers to pay the man his fee plus a generous tip just to leave without doing the work at all. But the man still refuses to go, relentlessly searching for any excuse that he could come up with to get inside of the house. Fed up, Tom confronts him, saying that he doesn't believe a word of his story and insisting that he turns back for now. Just then, the truck shuts off and a second man begins to approach the door. It's Bobby Ray, the man who attacked Emma all those years ago. And unlike his younger brother Jimmy here, he's not interested in playing it smooth. Without saying a word, he storms right past his brother and immediately stabs Tom to death, using his body to break through the door. Emma barely has time to hide around the corner as the men start searching the house, but luckily, Bobby happens to turn around an instant before he would have found her. Jimmy here is completely freaked out, having no idea that killing anyone was going to be part of the job, but Bobby insists that they're already in too deep and leaves him to search the bottom floor while he checks for Emma upstairs. While they're occupied, Emma quietly slips out through the back door, dragging herself and Mark over to the boathouse as quickly as she can. With Jimmy following close behind, the front door is chained shut, slowing her down, but she manages to circle around onto the frozen lake and get in from the other end. Once there, Emma finds a heavy steel anchor and begins trying to chop Mark's hand off but is forced to hide when Jimmy breaks through the door. After seeing the body, he runs back to the house to get his brother, which gives Emma a brief window to finish the job. Okay, this might look like a tough spot for Emma here, but knowing that they're coming can actually work to her advantage if she makes her next moves wisely. Plus, now that she's finally free from Mark, she can get a bit more creative with her approach. So it's time to go on the offense and turn these tables on these creeps before they have the chance to track her down. She may be outnumbered and overpowered in a fair fight, but it's always possible to even the odds a little by finding a way to set a trap. If she moves quickly, it might be possible to use the anchor to weaken the ice around Mark's body so that when they come up to investigate, one of them ends up falling in the water. This would effectively remove that person from the board for as long as it takes to dry off their clothes and get warmed up because preventing death from hypothermia will quickly become more important than finding her, at least for a little while. Alternatively, she could use some of the ropes that are all around the boathouse to quickly set a trap by the door, causing them to trip and then bashing them with the anchor when they lose their balance. If she's not feeling up for a fight just yet, there's always the option to quickly sneak out to their truck and hide in there if it's unlocked. I mean, it probably is the last place that they'd ever look, and if they did come in there and start the car, then she could sneak attack them from the back seat, knock them out, and steal the truck to get back to safety. Besides this, I'd also consider trying to get Jimmy here on my side if the opportunity presented itself. From their conversation back in the house, it's pretty clear that Jimmy isn't completely in on the whole murder plan, and she might be able to win him over in a pinch if she's convincing enough. Coming out of hiding at all is going to be risky, but she needs to consider all of her options if she's going to survive. When the two of them return to the boathouse, Emma here has already set herself free, but she didn't have time to get far. Hiding just out of sight, she listens in as Bobby reveals that Mark was actually the one who hired them, and they're not leaving until they can get into that safe back upstairs. It won't be simple though, because there are only two people who know the code. With Mark dead, this leaves only Emma, and they won't be giving up until they find her and get that combination. Thinking it through, Bobby comes to the conclusion that the winter conditions are too harsh for her to have made it anywhere on her own, meaning that she must still be somewhere on the property. Once they're gone, Emma here comes out of hiding, determined not to let this psycho hurt her ever again. Searching the boat, she finds a fuel line and a heavy tank full of gasoline, which gives her an idea. 
Meanwhile, the criminals circle back up to the master bedroom and take a look at the safe. According to Jimmy, they'll need a fingerprint to get inside, and there's no way to tell whether it's Mark's or Emma's that will do the trick. Outside, Emma drags the gas tank over to the garage and manages to get there without the killers noticing. So far, her plan is working surprisingly well, but just as she starts to fuel up the SUV, Bobby comes walking in after her. Emma here ducks under the truck and holds her breath while Bobby paces around the garage hunting for her, until suddenly he stops dead in his tracks. It looks like he's about to find her, but instead he draws a knife and slashes one of the tires before deciding to search inside of the vehicle which gives Emma an opportunity to slip back outside. Almost immediately, she sees Jimmy dragging Mark's body back towards the house, forcing her to take cover in the basement to avoid being seen. Terrified, Emma sprints across the basement and starts climbing up the steps into the rest of the house, just as Bobby closes in behind her, leaving an obvious trail of bloody footprints as she goes. When she reaches the top of the stairs, she can hear Jimmy in the hallway right on the other side of the door, leaving her trapped with nowhere to run. With Bobby just feet away, she makes the split-second decision to activate the car alarm causing both of them to go running back towards the garage. While they're distracted, Emma makes her first dumb decision of the day and decides to waste a bunch of time sharing a heartfelt moment with Tom's dead body before searching him for his car keys. Back outside, Bobby locks the cellar door shut with a broomstick, making sure that she won't be able to escape that way again. Jimmy still wants to call this whole thing off, but his brother insists that they have to see this through as a way to get back at Emma for sending him to prison and ruining his life. He correctly judges that she must have set off the car alarm as a distraction because they were getting too close, which can only mean that she's still somewhere in the house. So the two of them split up to search for her inside. Okay, that was a close call. Emma here's managed to survive this long, but she won't make it much longer if she keeps hiding, when she should be using the element of surprise to fight back. To be fair, hiding might seem like a safer choice than going up against two stronger opponents but she has to take her particular circumstances here into consideration. Hiding won't work forever now that they know for a fact that she's in the house and has nowhere to run. Sooner or later, she's gonna have to fight. So it's better to do it now while she at least has the advantage of them not knowing exactly where she is. And you know, the brothers splitting up actually gives her a great opportunity to catch them one-on-one. -on -one. If it were me, I'd want to go after Bobby here first since he's the most dangerous and most determined to kill her. It isn't going to be easy, but if she hides out and grabs any weapon that's available, like a vase or a piece of furniture, she could jump him from behind, keep hitting him until he stops moving, and then take his knife and truck keys and get the hell out of there before they even have a chance to regroup. When Jimmy makes it to the front door, he points out that Tom's body is missing his shoes, indicating that she's been through there very recently. Bobby heads back upstairs, and that's when he hears creaking noises coming from the attic. Knowing that it must be Emma, he quietly draws his knife and starts to make his way up there, determined to end this once and for all. Up in the attic, Bobby notices a sheet that looks out of place and calmly walks over to it, thinking that he's finally found Emma. As it turns out, she really is hiding up there, but not in the place that he thinks. It's a trap, and the moment that he lifts the sheet, Emma springs up from her hiding spot, cracking Bobby over the head with a golf club and sending him crashing through the ceiling to the floor below. With Bobby unconscious, she quickly grabs the truck keys out of his pocket, but has to hide again when she hears Jimmy closing in up the stairs. Distracted by the sight of his injured brother, he's caught completely unaware. When Emma lunges at him with the golf club, the impact sends him flying into a bedroom, and Emma immediately slams the door shut before knocking off the doorknob, leaving him trapped inside. Seizing the opportunity, Emma rushes outside and begins trying to start Tom's car, only for Bobby to show up like Michael Myers and bash open the driver's side window. As he's dragging her out, she manages to quickly get a hold of Tom's phone, dial 911, and scream for help. But Bobby wrestles the phone away, snapping it in half and throwing it into a snowbank. Jimmy manages to get himself free and says that he wants to leave now that the cops are on their way. But Bobby insists that they still have time, threatening to kill his own brother if he doesn't do as he's told. Lying on the ground, Emma swears that she didn't even know the combination to the safe, but Bobby isn't falling for it. 
and stomps her unconscious before taking her back upstairs. Okay, and this right here is an example of why you should always finish the murderer off when you have the chance. The situation is looking worse than ever, but Jimmy here is right about one thing. The police are most likely on their way. It's probably going to take them a while to get there, but whatever happens next, Emma here needs to drag it out for as long as possible while still cooperating just enough not to get killed, but not so much that she ends up being useless. She may be caught, but they won't kill her until they've opened the safe, so she needs to use this to her advantage and play it cool until help arrives, or another opportunity to escape turns up. When she wakes up, Emma realizes that she's been handcuffed to her husband's body once again. The two men have dragged the safe out into the center of the room, and Bobby is determined to get it open no matter what he has to do. Still, Emma insists that she doesn't know the code causing Bobby to leap up on top of her and slice the back of her shirt open, revealing the scar from where he stabbed her during their last confrontation. It turns out that Mark already told him that the combo to the safe is the date that he proposed to Emma, and if she isn't going to tell him the number willingly, then he's more than happy to get it out of her the hard way, desperately. Emma begs Jimmy to help her, but when he tries to reason with his brother, Bobby shoves him down to the floor. This ends up backfiring on Bobby here, because Jimmy finds the revolver lying under the bed and levels it at his back, threatening to shoot it if he doesn't step away. With no other choice, Bobby puts the knife down and moves to the other side of the room. Now that Jimmy here is in charge of the situation, he decides to offer Emma a deal. She gives them the combo to the safe and they let her go alive. Bobby immediately freaks out, saying that she'll report them to the police if they let her live, but his brother points out that he'll still be the first suspect if they find her dead, forcing him to agree. Using his tools, Jimmy picks open the handcuffs, setting Emma free, and she gives them the code to the safe. It works, but instead of the quarter million worth of diamonds that they were promised, all that Bobby finds inside is a stainless steel hacksaw inscribed with the message that the diamonds lay close to her heart. Jimmy and Emma realize that the diamonds must be in her necklace, but she tells them that there's no way to get it off. Bobby, on the other hand, begs to differ. He's gonna get those diamonds, even if he has to saw Emma's head off to do it. Grabbing the gun, Bobby pistol whips his brother out of the way before lowering the weapon at Emma, only to realize that it was never loaded. Furious, he tackles Emma to the floor, but Jimmy leaps onto his back, trying to pull him off. At this point, nothing is going to stop him, and they battle it out until Bobby stands up and accidentally slams the back of his brother's head into a coat hack on the wall killing him instantly. Heartbroken at the loss of his brother, Bobby here decides that it's somehow all Emma's fault and vows that he's going to kill her if it's the last thing that he does. Grabbing the knife, Emma attempts to fight him off, but does a pretty horrible job of it and ends up getting stabbed in the leg. Luckily, she manages to knock Bobby out with a set of bolt cutters and handcuffs him to Mark's body as she makes her escape. With Bobby closing in, she makes it to the garage and fires up the truck, slamming it in reverse and crashing it into the other cars in the driveway. No matter how hard she pushes, the cars won't budge, and Emma quickly realizes that her only choice is to go forwards instead. So she puts it in drive and takes Bobby with her as she busts straight through the other side. It works, but the truck loses traction on the icy ground, sending her through the wall of the boathouse and briefly knocking her out. Okay, Remember what I said about always finishing the murderer off? Come on, Emma! She could have killed him with the bolt cutters right there in the bedroom, but she let him live once again and now she's paying the price. Also, here's an idea. That truck looks like it has four-wheel drive, so why not try going through the snow, around the parked cars, and out of the driveway instead of nearly driving straight into a frozen lake? Or at least make sure that if you're trying to run the guy over, you get it done without nearly taking yourself out in the process. It's officially the end of the line, and hopefully Emma can pull this off. By the time that Bobby gets there, Emma is already gone, but she can't get far on her injured leg. Desperate to escape, she crawls out onto the frozen lake as Bobby closes in behind her, quickly catching up to her and pinning her to the ground. Just when it looks like she's done for, Emma uses the last of her strength to kick Bobby back and stab him in the arm. Sure enough, the weight of him falling causes cracks in the ice, sending Mark's body falling into the lake and pulling Bobby in with him. But at the last second, he grabs her by the collar and drags Emma in too. 
deep below the freezing water. Bobby pulls her head to his chest, deciding that if he's going to drown, then she's coming with him. But Emma here isn't going down without a fight. Grabbing the knife out of his shoulder, she reaches back and stabs Bobby in his one good eye, forcing him to let her go. Swimming up, she manages to make it back to the surface, only to realize that she can't find her way back out. Still, she's come too far to die like this, and in a last-ditch effort to escape, she uses the knife to break through the ice, pulling herself up onto the surface of the lake. She made it, and somewhere in the distance, she can hear police sirens on their way. Pulling off her wedding ring, she decides to let it drop into the water and breathes a sigh of relief, free to live her own life at last. But, uh, what would you do if your partner dragged you out into the middle of nowhere and then died while he was still handcuffed to you? Don't you think you would try to call 911 immediately? I mean, what would you do? I'm, I, let me know down in the comments below. Thank you so much for watching. Leave a like and subscribe and check out the How to Beat playlist for more videos just like this. The How to Beat Patreon is there for you to see the uncensored version of tonight's episode. And, uh, have a damn good day.